Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Butterfly Conservation's first online AGM. I am Karen Goldie Morrison. This is my first AGM as chair, and I'm particularly sorry not to be able to see you all in person. The consolation is that many cons Butterfly Conservation members have been able to join us on Zoom than they could normally in person. I think we expect we have over 800 registered. I'm not sure what the tally of um, attendance is at the moment. Like you, my colleagues and I on the panel are all in our respective homes. So we will aim to make the transitions between us as smooth as possible. Since we met this time last year in Shrewsbury, there has been a huge amount of change within butterfly conservation. In that time, many good things have happened, but we have faced some, some difficult challenges. To ensure everybody is safe, it was not possible to hold the, the Members' Day or proceed with the annual awards this year. I do hope we'll be able to resume these normal pr procedures in 2021. Of course, today would not happen at all without the enormous amount of hard work behind the scenes from the head office team. I'd particularly like to thank Sarah Adlam and uh, James Staples, who have worked extremely hard to bring this event together for our enjoyment today. Thank you to them. And I'd also like to thank all who have contributed uh, from head office, a big thank you. Following the formal AGM today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Fox, who is Associate Director of Recording and Monitoring at Butterfly Conservation, who will talk about butterfly conservation's impact on the climate crisis. We will now proceed with the formal event. Before we start the AGM, may I please have your attention regarding some technical details. All microphones have been muted on joining, except for the speaker, which in this case is me. If your connection drops out, please try connecting again using the, the unique link you received when you registered. This event is being recorded and will be made available on Butterfly Conservation's website. We asked all of you to submit any questions to us before the meeting. We will answer as many of these as we have time for today. We do apologize in advance if we don't have time to answer all of them or any that remain unanswered, we'll have answers posted on our website. After Richard's talk, we will run a very short feedback poll where you can let us know how we did today. We will let you know when it is starting and all you will need to do is to click three answers to three short questions. If anybody wishes to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag at BCAGM. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now formally open the AGM. Notice having been properly served together with the agenda, council election addresses and proxy voting details all of which were circulated to all members with the 2019-20 annual review. So I go to the first item, apologies for absence. From members, we have apologies from Wendy Burnett, David Wood, Candida Doyle, Madeline Russell, Simon Davies, Richard Eleanor, John Arnott, Stuart Lindsay and Fiona McKenna. We also have apologies from one of our vice presidents, Anthony Hoare. And last and most sadly, we have an apology from our chief executive, Julie Williams, who has COVID and cannot be with us today. We are very sorry about this and we wish her all, wish, wishes from all of us for her speedy recovery. And of course, Julie has sent her sincere apologies to you all. I'm therefore very pleased to welcome Russell Hobson, who is Butterfly Conservation's Director of Evidence and Resources, who will deliver the Chief Executive's report later this morning. We move on to the minutes of the AGM held on the 16th of November 2019 in Shrewsbury. The minutes of the meeting have been published on our website, and as they have been made available to those wishing to see a copy, I'm going to take them as having been read. Proxy votes on the resolution to approve the minutes have been cast in advance. 
we received 315 votes in favour, zero votes against, 42 votes abstaining. Thank you. The minutes are approved. There are no matters arising. The next item we come to is the annual report. I will now present the chair's report to members. So good morning again to you all. This year has been my first as chair of butterfly conservation and what a year it is proving to be and it's not over in any sense. While confronting what the future might hold for butterfly conservation, we first need to recognize the successes of our 2019-2020 year. And what are those successes? As you remember, 2019 was a painted lady summer. It was the best year for butterfly populations since 1997, <clears throat> according to the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. Maybe the overall rate of butterflies is slowing, of decline of butterflies is slowing, and for some species being reversed. Many conservation measures are working, although long trends term trends are of course a concern. Butterfly conservation's membership passed the 40,000 mark. Big butterfly count is a major driver of membership and in 2019 attracted 113,000 citizen scientists. Butterfly conservation continues to foster active participation in the natural world. The estimate of the value of butterfly conservation supporters to conservation landscape management and to the eight citizen science projects is currently 40 million pounds. Butterfly conservation's financial reserves remain stable. It had been developing its infrastructure to support the revised conservation strategy. It had been building partnerships to influence the state of species conservation in the UK. Butterfly conservation's work continues to add significantly to the understanding of, of insect conservation. Recording and analyzing data on species numbers and distribution is a major output of butterfly conservation's work. Butterfly conser butterflies and moths are bellwethers of changing conditions, for example, climate warming, and butterfly conservation's data analysis contributes to influence environmental policy in the UK. Then along came COVID-19. The world's response has been unprecedented. Apart from instilling an atmosphere of almost universal fear, our government and many others worldwide have committed extraordinary sums to keep the economies going. And, uh, and we have once again rising rates of infection as winter approaches and are enduring another lockdown. COVID is a manifestation of what happens when we squeeze nature into ever more constricted spaces. It increases the likelihood of diseases jumping from animals to humans. We know now, if we hadn't before, that human society is not good at dealing with looming emergencies. The powers that be knew that a pandemic was likely, yet the world did little to prepare for it. What about the other global crises the world has been too slow to confront? Biodiversity collapse and the climate crisis. A 68% fall in vertebrate species since 1970, according to the 2020 Living Planet Report from the World Wide Fund for Nature. In the UK, a 41% decline in the species studied during the same period. And after 30 years of international attempts at tackling global warming, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere continues to rise. Butterfly Conservation's president, Sir David Attenborough, has been ever more prominent this year. In his latest program and book, A Life on Our Planet, Sir David refers to the tragedy that has unfolded during his lifetime, how he has been witness to nature's decline. He talks about the devastation of our natural world that will occur in just one more lifetime if we, don't, if we continue to do too little. He finishes by painting a picture of an alternative future, one where we rethink a sustainable way of life and encourage nature 
to say it stabilize and return. How very welcome that would be. How are we meeting these challenges? The United Nations labels climate change the defining issue of our time. In addition to the reduction of fossil fuel use, nature-based solutions will be one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and can provide positive benefits to biodiversity as well. The UK government proposes an environmental land management scheme. These include natural capital incentives for landowners and farmers to restore natural systems. Measuring the wealth of our nation has never previously included nature in its calculations. Within this new policy framework, effective collaborations among conservation organizations are ever more important. Together, we must ensure politicians create policies that tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. Butterfly conservation also stands up for species conservation. Rethink Nature is a partnership between butterfly conservation and six other species NGOs. Together, Rethink Nature delivers a conservation program in England with others being developed for Scotland and Wales. We show policymakers how landscape conservation can work, not only for nature, but also for landowners. As conservationist Norman Myers said, when politicians decide to do nothing, they decide to do a great deal in a world that is not standing still. So where are we now? Butterfly conservation is having a severely disrupted year. Projects and fundings have been delayed, postponed or cancelled. The disruption is likely to continue. Our honorary treasurer, Nigel Symington, will summarise the possible financial impact of the pandemic and the world's response. CEO Julia Williams's report will explain in more detail how butterfly conservation has adapted to the challenges of this year and will incorporate changes in the next phase of development. I would like to thank Julie and all staff at Butterfly Conservation. These are torrid times. All have shown an ability to refocus priorities and adapt very quickly to challenging new circumstances and ways of working. Our council is from today just 10 trustees. Some long-standing trustees are stepping down. I will miss their contributions. I want to thank them and my remaining colleagues on council for all their support during this my first year as chair and to thank them also for their active involvement and commitment to the governance of butterfly conservation. Since becoming chair, I have led council on an inquiry into butterfly conservation's fundamental purpose and the impacts it seeks in the longer term. While we fight inevitable fires, none of us will lose sight of what we are seeking to achieve. We do have reasonable financial reserves and we do intend to continue to protect and restore butterflies and moths and their landscapes while inspiring the public to engage with them. And what about nature and human well-being? We have just entered another lockdown. During the last lockdown, albeit in warmer weather, people poured into their local areas and challenged how we use our green spaces. Of course, how we treat our landscape is as much about education as it is about environmental policy. Many reported observing and enjoying nature on their doorstep in a way that they'd never before. The link between access to nature and physical and mental health and well-being is now being researched and documented. There is also the hope that access to nature might rank higher on the nation's agenda. Let me end with a personal reflection. My butterfly count in West London this summer showed me again the power of watching nature. As I begin, began my 15 minute vigil in my garden, a red admiral floated by at my feet. A hummingbird hawk moth whizzed to my buddleia to join a peacock already settled there and a gatekeeper alighted on my scabious. Like me, 
I hope that you will continue to derive great joy from contact with nature and with butterflies and moths over the coming year. Butterfly conservation members, volunteers and supporters are key to butterfly conservation. You help us continue our work and achieve our goals. You are more important than ever to butterfly conservation. Thank you all, wherever you are today, and thank you again to those of you who have attended the AGM today. That's the end of my chair's report. And we now move to the next item, which is the treasurer's report to members. This will be presented by Nigel Symington, our honorary treasurer. I will now pass over to you, Nigel. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Usually at this meeting, I go through the results for the financial year ended on the last March the 31st. However, I will today add some comments on our progress since then to touch on how the pandemic has affected our finances, what action we have taken to address this, and to reassure you that in spite of the extraordinary uncertainty of the present economic situation, the future of our charity is in safe hands. The last year was in fact another very successful one for us. The UK really only woke up to the full implications of the virus at the beginning of March, by which time most of our income and expenditure for the year had been determined. In fact, we had another record year in both these respects. Income rose to 4.5 million pounds, while our total expenditure reached a record 4.9 million, of which expenditure on conservation was 4.2 million. So you'll note that expenditure in the year exceeded our income. We spent 378,000 more than we received. This reduction in the level of reserves, which we had built up over a number of years, was planned after careful consideration by council on the basis that our money is best put to use on conservation work in the field rather than left languishing in the bank. Notwithstanding this, we maintained a prudent level of financial reserves at the year end, covering six months of operating costs. Our most important single source of income at 1.3 million was from grants received in support of conservation activities. The largest of these were the Back from the Brink project, which comes via Natural England, and from three new grants awarded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The climate for grant funding grows ever more difficult, and this results reflect a very successful year from our fundraising team. Our next largest source, and clearly also vital to us, comes from membership subscriptions, including the all important gift aid at 1.1 million. And the generosity of our members has been further reflected in the high level of donations and legacies. At 600,000, donations were level with the year before. Legacy income has grown significantly in recent years to become a very important source of funding. And we are most grateful to those who have left us such valuable gifts in their wills. Also amounting to 600,000, legacy income was actually down 11% from the prior year. However, you will understand that by its very nature, this income stream is difficult to forecast and is liable to fluctuate significantly from year to year. We crossed the noteworthy threshold last year of enrolling 40,000 members, 9% up on the year before. We are fortunate to have a very loyal membership base with nearly nine out of 10 of our members renewing each year. And not only loyal, but also actively engaged. The recording, monitoring and conservation delivery work undertaken by our vast army of wonderful volunteers and citizen scientists working either on their own or through our branch structure or with our partners is unique to butterfly conservation and vital not only to the delivery of our conservation projects, but also to building up the huge base of scientific evidence that underpins our work. 
we estimate the value of this at 14 million pounds. This figure doesn't, of course, appear anywhere in our financial statements, but if it did, it would be by far the largest source of income. Coming on to expenditure, the largest spend is on conservation, most of which is staff costs at nearly three million pounds. We're fortunate to have a very highly trained specialist and dedicated staff. But from a financial perspective, this does give us a very high fixed cost base, which makes it difficult for us to maneuver when we need to adapt to changing circumstances. And although I opened by saying that most of our income and expenditure for the year was determined before the impact of the pandemic was upon us, it did indeed strike at our balance sheet, namely that at the year end, the value of our endowment fund had declined materially as a result of market falls from 5.5 to 4.7 million. This resulted in an unrealized investment loss of just over 800,000 pounds. This shows as a net loss in our financial statement. But I must stress that unrealized means that because we have not sold assets, it does not imply a cash outflow or jeopardize our ongoing activities. At the beginning of the year, no one imagined the scale of the devastation that was about to be caused by COVID-19, not just in the short term, but the inevitable impact for some years to come. The charity sector overall is facing a 10 billion pound shortfall in funding. I've mentioned that our largest single source of income last year was from grants. As soon as COVID hit, we were told that our grant income will be significantly reduced this year. Many funders, including the National Lottery Heritage Fund, closed opportunities for any new funding applications until at least next March while other funders either reduced the amount they have available or indicated that they would direct their grants towards charities operating more directly to relieve pressures caused by the impact of COVID-19. This is clearly a significant and known adverse income impact on our income for this year. Many large companies either reduce their dividend payments in response to the crisis or eliminated them altogether. This does affect us, not only in that our income from our endowment fund will be lower, but there will be a further and possibly greater likely impact on members' own abilities or preferences to make financial contributions to butterfly conservation. It's still too early to say what will be the effect on our membership renewal rates, but I can say that we were most encouraged by the generous response we received from members to our summer appeal and from those branches who contributed funds to help us out at this challenging time. We forecast that the effect of all this will be to reduce our income by around one million pounds this year. A million pounds, that's almost a quarter of the total. We expect that 2021 will be another tough year with a reduction of a further half million pounds. This is an existential matter we had to cut costs quickly in order to ensure that the charity will survive. This led to the difficult and painful decision that the only way to do this would be to make some reduction in staff numbers. And indeed it was unsettling and upsetting for all of us to see 11 of our expert colleagues and friends leave. We also took advantage of the government's furlough scheme between April and July a total of 27 staff members were furloughed, but all varied in the length of time away. Most were furloughed for a month. Though a total of six furloughed staff were lost as part of the restructure, most are now back at work. We have worked together with our auditors to develop new financial control parameters, which are being reviewed both by management and by trustees on a regular basis. Our cash outflow will be around 1.1 million over the next three years, and it will be from this smaller base that we will grow again in the future. Although we are now operating in a climate of more than usual uncertainty, to the best of our belief, we have achieved a balanced financial position from which to renew and rebuild.
going forward. And not only financial, every member of the butterfly conservation family has done their bit to ensure our survival. We have a strong management team to lead our operations, but most important of all, we have all of you, our branches, members, supporters, and volunteers. I cannot thank you enough for your generosity and support, which has been so vital in building the charity to the position in which it is today. And I look forward with confidence to the future as we work together to ensure that we can continue to enjoy the fantastic beauty of our butterflies and moths. So thank you all. I propose now that we adopt the report and accounts for the year ended March the 31st, 2020. And I will hand back to Karen to tell us the results of the proxy votes on this issue. Thank you, Nigel. Proxy votes on the resolution to adopt the annual report and financial statement have been cast in advance. We received 324 votes in favor, four votes against, 29 votes abstaining. The annual report and consolidated accounts and balance sheet for the year ended 31st of March 2020 are therefore approved. Next, we need to appoint auditors and authorize council to fix their remuneration. We believe that we have been particularly well served by Buzzacott over the last year. Nigel meets several times with Amanda Francis, our audit partner, who understands us well. We remain extremely pleased with their diligence in dealing with the accounts and any other technical matters which we, which we seek their advice. Nigel has proposed the reappointment of Buzzacott and for council to be authorized to set their remuneration. Proxy votes on the resolution to appoint the auditors have been cast in advance. We received 329 votes in favor, two votes against, 26 votes abstaining. The reappointment of Buzzacott and authorization for council to set their remuneration has been approved. The next item is the Chief Executive Officer's report. And it is my great pleasure to pass you over to Russell Hobson, who is delivering Julie Williams's report in her absence. Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased that so many of you have joined us today. This is obviously not the setting we're used to, but wherever you are joining us from, welcome. I am also deeply sad not to be with you in person today, but I am grateful to Russell Hobson for reading my talk to you in his own style. For those of you who have read the charity news, you will be familiar with the devastating effect COVID-19 has had on the voluntary sector. Many charities are facing big losses. BC and many of our environmental partners have not been immune to the effects of the pandemic. I am sure you've heard of some of the big job losses in charities like the National Trust, but there are also a number of smaller NGOs who are still currently going through a restructure as a, as a direct consequence of the pandemic. The sector as a whole will be much smaller with fewer staff employed when we end this year. As Nigel has already explained, we sadly had to get, say goodbye to 11 valued colleagues over the summer. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank them all for their hard work and for their many achievements. Although it has been a difficult few months, moving quickly and reducing our expenditure and our staff numbers has without doubt put us in a much stronger position, both financially and organizationally, and we are now able to start to plan and move forward in the future. For our remaining staff, it has also been incredibly tough, both personally and professionally. Adapting to working from home, the threat of losing their jobs, adapting to a new norm, and all the while striving to do all they can for butterflies and moths. I would like to thank them for remaining positive, motivated and focused I am inspired daily by their commitment and their dedication and their hard work. While I am on a roll with thank yous, I would also like to say a huge thank you to Dr. Nigel Bourne and Dr. Sam Ellis, who stood down from the senior leadership team earlier in the year. 
their decision to focus their efforts on our evidence and research plans and our international work respectively has meant a restructure within the senior leadership team. I am deeply grateful for their hard work over many years and I look forward to working with them in their new roles. I would also like to thank my new senior leadership team for their hard work, vision and leadership over the last few months. Russell Hobson heading up the evidence and resources teams, Dr Dan Hall leading our conservation directorate, and Dr. Kate Dent, who joined the team just as COVID hit and who is developing our engagement and volunteering work. It has been a pleasure working with them as a team, leading BC through these extraordinary times. I am deeply grateful to our Chair Karen and our trustees for all their support and excellent governance. And to the dedicated and passionate volunteers who have adapted so well to the new COVID secure way of working. Their expertise and tireless hard work is invaluable in protecting butterflies and moths. I thank you and them all. And my last thank you is to you, our members, all 41,000 of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for staying loyal to butterfly conservation and for your welcome and much needed donations. You make our work possible your support means we can continue to focus on the recovery of our most threatened species and create a world where butterflies and moths thrive and can be enjoyed by everyone. I don't have time today to go through the many areas of our work, so I will be talking about some of the new initiatives we are focusing on alongside our normal work and some of our plans for the coming year. Our vision and what we want to achieve by 2030 needs to be focused rightly on the changing world around us. What should butterfly cons conservation's role be in tackling the climate and biodiversity crisis we face? How do we create access to nature for all? How do we influence using our evidence and research? And how do we demonstrate that we are a solution focused in our in our work to protect butterflies and moths and indeed all nature. And then there is the small thing, actually conserving threatened species in the many landscapes across the UK and beyond. We face a huge challenge, but one we cannot shy away from. Our conservation strategy identified 200 priority landscapes for butterflies and moths across the UK. So we've got a lot of ground to cover but we do hold over 40 million species records and our ability to tap into this high quality data enables a truly evidence-based approach which maximizes our success. Developing a new 2030 strategy that outlines our plans for the next few years has been a major focus of our work over the last few months. How do we engage and inspire? How do we build our evidence work and use our research and data to truly influence the green recovery debate? How do we conserve and recover species and landscapes? And how does butterfly conservation become a sustainable organisation with a pathway to net carbon neutral and with diverse and reliable income streams? We are developing our plans and goals of how we're going to deliver our work and achieve our overarching aim of protecting butterflies and moths. We need to be ambitious in what we will deliver and the impact we will make. We hope to launch our new strategy and goals next year. There has been no doubt over the last few months, more people than ever have experienced nature during lockdown. It is now clear that increased exposure to nature and green spaces is beneficial for all our health. Over 110,000 people took part in our biggest citizen science initiative, Big Butterfly Count, and they counted over 1.4 million butterflies and moths. A tremendous achievement. During the height of the count, we were receiving over 4,000 messages on social media a week. And it was clear that Big Butterfly Count was even more important this year. It helped people feel like they were contributing to something positive and feeling better for doing so. Two of my favourite quotes highlighted the positive effect the count had on many people. Who does not smile at a butterfly? Stress levels going down already. And I haven't felt this good in a long time. 
We are aiming to quantify the impacts of participation more thoroughly by working with an academic partner in 2021. Being able to clearly demonstrate the benefits of our work for people's well-being has never been more relevant. We are currently developing an overarching engagement and volunteering strategy, which will of course underpin our commitment to existing volunteers and activities, but also sets out how we can broaden our reach and appeal to underrepresented groups, such as those in, in our major towns and cities. This is something the sector is becoming increase, increasingly aware of and committed to address. Research carried out by Natural England during the summer highlighted the new find, found value urban communities in particular placed on time spent in nature. So in the coming year, we'll also be working to explore how we, we can better reach and support these communities. We know that when people experience nature, they see and they feel the benefits for themselves. They are more inclined also to protect and care for it in future. Our planned flagship urban community project, Big City Butterflies, will be working to connect people to nature and green spaces in London. The decision on funding for this new project has sadly been postponed because of COVID, but we are due to hear in December. With further funding, we hope to roll this work out to other urban areas across the UK in, in future. Ensuring that everyone has access to nature also means that butterfly conservation must, as a matter of urgency, review and implement changes to the way we approach equality, diversity and inclusion. Across the sector, there is now a real groundswell of acknowledgement and growing determination to do something much more proactive to encourage, actively encourage broader participation. It is increasingly important that butterfly conservation needs to play its part too, as doing anything less is not an option. Firstly, because it's just plain and simple the right thing to do, but secondly, because if we don't, we will continue to exclude significant numbers of potential members and volunteers. EDI, of course, encompasses a great deal more than ethnicity, but I wanted to highlight some quite shocking statistics. Our sector, is very nearly the worst of any in terms of ethnic diversity, only beaten by farming in the index of diversity rankings. This is further demonstrated by a survey carried out by Wildlife and Countryside Link members who collectively employ 11,000 staff. Their data suggests that only 66 individuals have a black, Asian or minority ethnic background. Regarding BC members, a survey in 2019 revealed that 1.6 of BC members were from a Black, Asian or minority ethnic background. If I may be even more challenging, I think our trustee board and staff combined do little to improve the overall picture regarding ethnicity. It is now also well understood that urban communities are less able to access green space compared to their rural counterparts because there isn't any near them. Clearly a case of inequality. As I mentioned, during the pandemic, Natural England carried out monthly surveys with nearly half of adults reporting that nature and wildlife is more important than ever to their well-being. These figures cut across the whole population. So we are getting messages that our work is potentially becoming more important and valued by whole groups of people we are currently failing to reach in any meaningful way. We have started to try and address some of our shortcomings regarding EDI and these include taking an active role in the Wildlife and Countryside Link EDI group and we have just started work to form a Rethink Nature Forum to start the conversation and move things forward to achieve our challenging and yet crucial goal of becoming a more diverse and inclusive sector. We are also supporting a year-long sector-wide review being led by Natural England that should provide us with greater insights to help us going forward. Our new engagement strategy is also focused on volunteering addressing how we support our existing branches and volunteers better and improve our offer and appeal to potential new volunteers. 
it is important we ensure those who already volunteer are given all the support they need and have access to all the supporting resources in an easy and consistent way. Alongside this, we also need to improve how we actively attract and skill up the volunteers of the future and develop a centralised pro uh, organised programme of annual training for them. This will be a main focus of our work in the engagement directorate over the coming year. Our research and evidence work continues to be vitally important part of our work and I'm delighted that Dr Richard Fox is joining us this morning to highlight some of our work in this area, particularly around the impact of our work and how it relates to the climate crisis. Looking to the future, we are driving forward with our evidence team's work on future proofing our data management systems, helping our vital network of county recorders cope with increasing amounts of butterfly and moth records from different sources. Our applied ecology team will be collaborating with staff, volunteers and external partners to deliver our research priorities. I am especially proud that BC authors led two of the top three most cited articles in the Journal of Insect Conservation, demonstrating the high quality and reputation our research work holds. We will continue to use this evidence to influence policy at all levels across the UK. I'm sure you will have seen the recent media coverage around the nature crisis, including the eye-opening documentary Extinction by Butterfly Conservation's president, Sir David Attenborough. There are now one million species of animal and plants threatened with extinction. Karen has already highlighted this morning the recent figures from WWF's Living Planet report, revealing that global wildlife populations have plummeted by an average of 68% since 1970. Indeed, Butterfly Conservation's own data shows that two thirds of our native butterfly species are facing devastating declines, despite the many successes butterfly conservation has achieved. You can read some of our success stories in my re recent appeal letter and in Butterfly. Moving forward, the big challenge for butterfly conservation is not only to sustain and increase our work saving species, but to ensure this approach is aligned with changes and the increasing awareness in the sector. There is an increasing trend towards extensive landscape and habitat restoration, including nature recovery, rewilding, natural capital, natural capital around valuing uh, nature for the services it gives and natural climate solutions which help tackle the climate crisis. Many of these hold huge potential to be great for biodiversity, but we need to ensure that species are seen as a central part of this, with butterflies and moths an indicator of their success. Where does conservation of species like Heath Fritillary, found in four limited landscapes in southern England, fit against the backdrop of a bigger biodiversity and climate crisis? How do we plan future landscapes that can provide a home for species that may struggle with rising temperatures and changing land use? And how do we ensure that nature recovery aspirations make a real contribution to our commoner and more widespread species, many of which are also in rapid decline? Well, we can use our data, our case studies and our record of success. This is the evidence that these approaches are working, that landscapes are more connected, that ecosystems are restored, and that we found a way of allowing biodiversity to thrive in our cities, our farmland and our back gardens. This doesn't need, we need to abandon or radically alter our work, but we do need to promote the impact we make and offer up a positive vision of a world where butterflies and moths can thrive both the threatened species and the common ones which touch the lives of so many people. So we'll be looking at how we might put this vision across, developing a blueprint for butterflies and moths that sets out what we want to see and how we think we can get there. We need a compelling story of how the varying aspects of our work fit together and what they can deliver to produce a world where butterflies and moths thrive. 
we will be developing what this blueprint might look like and how we can use it to drive forward our work and get people to come with us to achieve it. There is no denying the scale of the challenge ahead for both butterfly conservation and the environmental sector. But I echo Sir David's sentiments. If we work together, we can create a future in which we live in harmony with nature once again. Our mission has never been more relevant. Together, energised by our purpose, we will continue to build an ever brighter future for butterflies and moths and for us all. All that remains now is for me to wish you and your families the best of health at this extraordinary time. I look forward to hopefully speaking to you face to face in happier and more normal circumstances next year. Thank you for listening. Stay safe and well. Thank you, Russell, and also to Julie in absentia. Next item we come to is council elections. The longest serving third of members of council are required to stand down from office at each AGM. If they have served for less than nine years, they are eligible for re-election along with any other butterfly conservation members wishing to stand for election. This year, Andy Barker, Roger Dobbs and Michael Johnston have stood down by rotation. Fiona Barclay resigned as a trustee earlier this year. Susan Foden is entitled and willing to stand for re-election. Roger Dobbs and Michael Johnston have come to the end of their nine years tenure. Andy Barker has stood down from office after six years tenure. I would like to say a big thank you to Roger, Michael and Andy for their dedication and commitment to council and butterfly conservation over the years. I know they will remain as valued volunteers. As approved at the 2019 AGM, council is reducing to 10 trustees as of today, which leaves two vacancies on council. We have a new candidate standing for election, Hugh Ellerton, who has submitted an election address, which was distri distributed with the invitation to this meeting. Hugh was nominated and is eligible and has made a declaration. There are sufficient vacancies for these appointments to take place without a contest. Proxy votes were cast in advance, and I will now read the results for each candidate individually in alphabetical order by surname. For the e election of Hugh Ellerton, 340 votes in favor, eight votes against, nine votes abstaining. For the re-election of Susan Foden, 339 votes in favor, six votes against, 12 votes abstaining. Proxy votes on the resolution to appoint Hugh Ellerton and Susan Foden as trustees have been cast in advance. We received 336 votes in favor, four votes against, 17 votes abstaining. I can formally declare that Hugh Ellerton is appointed as a trustee and Susan Foden is re-elected as a trustee. Thank you and welcome Hugh and welcome back Sue. We do now have a little time to answer several previously submitted questions. I'm very pleased now to welcome Dr. Dan Hoare and Dr. Kate Dent, who are joining the panel to help us answer questions. Dan is Director of Conservation and Kate is Director of Engagement and Volunteering. And both are members of the senior leadership team at Butterfly Conservation, along with Russell and Julie. Sarah, first question, please. The first question has been submitted by Tim Collins, who asks, this has not been a good year for the Painted Lady. What are the main reasons for this? So, so I'll answer that question. Yes, Thanks thank very you, much. Dan. Yes. Um, so the Painted Lady is one of the great migrants of the butterfly world. Um, so the numbers we see each year are the result of really a wave of butterflies sweeping out of North Africa and across Europe. So as a result, you can spot it almost anywhere in your garden or out in the countryside from beaches to mountain tops, but its appearance is really unpredictable. And 2020 has been a relatively poor year for the Painted Lady in the UK. 
Uh, as an example, in the three weeks of our annual Big Butterfly Count citizen science survey, about 8,000 sightings were logged this year, compared to more than 400,000 in the same period in 2019. The numbers that reach us are due to a combination of factors, including conditions in their core breeding grounds around the desert fringes of North Africa and Arabia, um, prevailing winds on the way and conditions through southern Europe. So conditions in North Africa and Arabia determine how many butterflies emerge there in early spring. And really fascinating recent studies of pollen samples on butterflies show that with favourable wind conditions, the first early migrants that can come straight from there to Northern Europe. Many more make shorter journeys into Southern Europe where they lay eggs on thistles, burdocks and other widespread plants. And those caterpillars feed up really quickly and give rise to more adults which continue the journey. And they may have two or three generations on their way before butterflies reach the UK. So poor breeding conditions or a change in the wind on route can block that migration and prevent the big numbers from reaching us. Remarkably, studies using radar data have shown that their offspring can migrate back south in the autumn, often at heights of more than 200 metres where they're not easily visible to us, but they go back south and give rise to more generations heading south. So the last really big migration to the UK was in 2009, when it's estimated that at least 11 million painted ladies reached the UK in spring and 21 million headed back south in autumn. And I personally remember the thrill of standing on a Hampshire hilltop on a, one day in 2009 and seeing thousands of painted ladies streaming northwards around me. These remarkable migrations remind us every year that our wildlife is really closely linked with habitats and weather conditions on a global scale, even for a common butterfly in your garden. And it makes every year really exciting. Thank you, Dan, very much. Sarah, another question. The next question is from John East, who asks, I understand that prior to the first lockdown, ambitious and financially costly plans were agreed, which resulted in a deficit budget being approved for the financial year 2020 to 21. Whilst appreciating that the coronavirus pandemic has had an effect on the ability of BC to carry out some of the work and schemes planned for 2020. In the interest of transparency, I would like to know what were the full details of these ambitious plans, what will now happen to them, the amount of any upfront expenditure incurred, and will this be recoverable by BC? Thank you, Sarah. Um, Nigel, you're going to have a go at that one? Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you, John, for this question which raises a number of issues, and I'd like to take the time to address all of these in turn. Perhaps I can start with a word about how we set our budgets. The first step is to estimate our income for the year. We then plan our expenditure in light of this anticipated income. Over the past few years, we have had very successful financial results with our income exceeding our budget. And as a result of this, the level of cash we carried over for, uh, from one year to the next had, had grown to a level higher than that which we felt was reasonable. Paradoxically, this can work against us in a number of ways. The Charity Commission don't like charities to hold too high a level of cash. They take the not unreasonable view that money that has been raised should be spent in pursuit of our charitable aims and not hoarded. And I imagine that our members and donors also feel the same way. Funders have also turned down grant requests in the past on the grounds that we're too rich and they expect us to spend more of our own money before they will consider an application. So we took the decision in each of the last two years that we should reduce our cash holding and the way to do this was by spending more on conservation work as you rightly point out, running a deficit budget. In our planning process, the proposed budget receives extensive scrutiny from the Audit and Risk Committee, who then recommend a budget to the full council, where there is again a robust discussion in which all trustees engage. It is only after this rigorous and critical examination that the budget is signed off. So although we have indeed run a deficit budget, 
This has been after thorough consideration and with a clear aim in view. We run a very large number of projects in any one year. Nearly 50 of the largest are listed in the annual report. Many of them run over more than one year. As we commit to a project, the funds necessary to ensure delivery are moved to a restricted fund, which therefore cannot be subsequently diverted to other purposes. The short answer to what will happen to them is that they will all run on to completion, although we have had to reprofile re some and delay others. We have, for example, decided to postpone the Kent Moths project. We delayed submitting our funding application for big city butterflies because, as I mentioned, the National Lottery Heritage Fund has closed for new funding applications. The delivery of some existing projects has in some cases had to be amended as a result of COVID-19 restrictions. For example, the Back from the Brink project has been extended. But we haven't cancelled any projects or suffered any waste of money as a result. It's difficult to cancel projects in midstream. In many cases, we have a contract with a grant giver. And if we were to cancel, we'd have to repay the grant. So we couldn't recover any upfront expenditure and other costs such as staff costs can't simply be switched off overnight. So we'd end up worse off financially by canceling projects than by completing them. Not to mention the reputational cost of failing to complete a contract. We have a very good name in this respect and we intend to keep it that way. Next year, when we anticipate a lower level of income than in the past, we will have to plan a less ambitious level of activity. We will be a smaller organization. As the economy recovers in the following years, we are confident that we will grow back again to our previous size and beyond. You raised a number of important points in your question and John, I hope that with this answer, I've addressed your concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, we, we've got time for uh, a, the, a third question. Um, Sarah, please. Okay, the, the next question is from Mel Mason, um, who asks, can BC be more proactive in recording the genome of butterfly populations on the edge of extinction and those being reintroduced from various donor sites? Um, I think that's probably one for you again, Dan, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. What an interesting question, Mel. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why genetics might be of direct interest to conservation programmes for threatened butterflies in the UK. And the first one is the idea that isolated populations might suffer from reduced genetic diversity compared to others, often referred to as inbreeding, and that could contribute to population declines. But there's actually very little evidence of this as a key factor driving declines in the UK. And we have collaborated in recent studies on, on important UK species like marsh fritillary and scotch argus. And these show that there's no clear relationship between genetic diversity and population size or isolation. And it's not driving the declines of those species or indeed where they're doing well. And indeed, as soon as you look at this topic in detail, you see that there's widely varying predictions and implications for population dynamics and for conservation between species and between habitats. In fact, variation between colonies is probably really important for local adaptation. So that's one of the reasons we should think really carefully about moving species around. In almost all cases, there are very clear limiting factors with habitat quality, um, how suitable habitat is for breeding for that species, habitat quality being by far the major issue driving population numbers. Many of our threatened species have evolved to colonise new habitat patches in small numbers and of course they have high reproductive rates so that in good conditions numbers can increase rapidly to build up large populations. And again habitat quality is what limits that. Even for reintroductions relatively small numbers can give rise to large populations and subsequent local adaptation and genetic drift between colonies can increase genetic diversity. Studies of the large blue show that the England population, um, which has been restored since it went extinct in the 1970s, is now more genetically diverse than the Swedish population it was derived from. 
a second reason to look at conservation genetics, aside from exploring interesting questions about ecology and evolution, is to investigate how different isolated populations might be, which might be another reason to conserve them if they're genetically distinct and they contribute something to the overall UK gene pool for a species. Our conservation strategy already states that we should work to prevent populations of threatened species being lost from any occupied landscape. And we put our resources into the hard work of keeping habitats and landscapes in good condition, rather than trying to create a gene bank, which might help us theoretically in the future. But we are collaborating with researchers to examine whether considering gene conservation units, i.e. genetically distinct populations within a species, uh, that's an approach that's being taken, for example, with tree stocks in the UK, whether that might be a good approach that could also work with invertebrates. But it's very early days. So we don't routinely take genetic samples from populations of threatened butterflies, in part because actually what you take, how many you collect, the way you do it, which microsatellite markers and other technical details you use vary depending on the question you're asking. What we do do is support and assist academic partners in specific studies where we think it can inform our conservation work. So I hope that answers your question a bit, Mel. Thank you, Dan. That's a terrific answer. Um, I think we've got we've got time for one more. Uh, Sarah, could you? OK, yes. Um, then the next question has been submitted by Cathy Keeley, who asks, what is being done to look after those interested in this subject and provide them with ongoing support and education to take it forward? <coughs> do you work with butterfly parks? And do you work with the Natural History Museum and Tring Museum? Okay, I think this is one for you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, um, and good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you to Cathy for um, a great question. In fact, um, two really good questions, I think. Um, if I may, I'll take the second one first, uh, which is really about partnership working, um, but to specifically address whether or not we do any work with the Natural History Museum um, in London. Absolutely, we've got a current project going on at the moment called Brilliant Butterflies, and that's actually a partnership with the Natural History Museum and London Wildlife Trust um, on chalk grassland species. Um, and it's really a, a good example of the principles we apply to all of our project work, which is obviously about sharing our skills um, and to ensure the best possible outcomes um, for the species or perhaps even the people um, who are the target for the, for the project. Um, so as an organisation, we absolutely subscribe to collaboration through partnerships. We remain open to partnerships. Um, including with parks and museums. Um, and I think as a sector, uh, we have over the years got much better at working collaboratively within partnerships. So butterfly conservation will absolutely continue to do so. Um, in respect of your um, first part of your question, which is really about supporting those who are interested in learning more, um, this kind of ties in very much with what um, Russell was saying within Julie's talk, Absolutely. Um, it's, it's part of an ongoing um, review that's currently going on into our wider engagement work, which again, Russell referred to. Um, although to be clear, we already do deliver um, a significant level of uh, engagement and learning opportunities kind of right across the range of those who may be interested. So for example, we currently offer formal educational sessions to children through our, our very successful munching caterpillars projects. Obviously families are very well served by the wonderful array of opportunities that branches provide through their walks and talks programs. And then we can have some very technical training actually for our more expert volunteers. Um, those for example, who are doing, <clears throat> excuse me, butterfly and moth uh, recording, for example. Um, so we absolutely have an aspiration to continue supporting those volunteers who are already working with us um, and members who are infused to learn more. But uh, again, as Russell mentioned, we are wanting to reach out to a broader audience now um, under, under the um, EDI agenda, again, that Russell was mentioning, um, with a particular focus coming forwards, we hope, uh, within the big City Butterflies project reaching more urban communities in London. Um, and we are uh, more generally looking to develop this um, annual 
programme of rolling uh, learning opportunities for people. Um, it would be remiss of me not to mention at this point, of course, the, um, the switch that we've all undertaken recently in terms of online and virtual engagement. And if I'm, if I'm reading the screen right, there are very nearly 400 of us um, enjoying this morning together, which may have been a challenge in any other way. Um, and so it's testament really to how we've all managed to, to adapt. And it does, by definition, make those opportunities more accessible um, to many people. So in conclusion, Cathy, absolutely, yes, we are wanting to work collaboratively going forwards as we have done for many years in partnerships and absolutely continue to develop um, the range of learning opportunities we have. Thank you very much, Kate, a very, very full, full answer to an interesting question. Um, I think that's really a, the, the number of questions that we can cope with in the time. Um, so I'll bring that session to an end. Thank you so much, Dan and, and Kate, for joining us for the, for the session. You're, I think you're going to stay with us on the panel, aren't you? Uh, the final formal item is to notify all of you of the next AGM, which will be Saturday 14th of November 2021. The actual venue has yet to be decided, but I do hope that we can all meet in person next time. And I, am, I gather that, it, that, that, that the venue will be somewhere in Yorkshire. And so we look forward to seeing you all there. So ladies and gentlemen, I can now formally close this AGM. I now have pleasure in handing over to Dr. Richard Fox for the special lecture this morning. Richard will be talking about butterfly conservation's impact on the climate crisis. Over to you, Richard. Thanks very much. Karen and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak at this uh, very unusual butterfly conservation AGM but as uh, Kate was just saying fantastic that so many people have been able to join us this morning. So uh, I hope you can see my uh, my slides okay um, and I'm hoping to show in the next 25 minutes or so how the evidence that butterfly conservation gathers, the moth and butterfly records that you submit has made a globally important contribution through scientific research to our understanding of climate change impacts on our wildlife. I'm not going to talk about climate change itself. I think there's uh, uh, the evidence and the data for that are clear and unequivocal. Um, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with charts like this, uh, where this dotted line here shows the uh, increase in average UK temperatures over the past 130 years or so. This is perhaps a more intuitive and interesting way of viewing the same data with each year uh, coloured according to its relative warmth. And if we zoom in on this, we can see that since butterfly conservation was founded back here in 1968, there's been a progressive warming of the UK climate. But it's butterflies and moths that you want to hear about, so let's uh, move on. Without going into all of the technical details, we can think of butterflies and moths as sort of essentially cold-blooded creatures. And this means that their lives both as adult butterflies and moths, but in all the stages of the life cycle as well, are largely governed by the climate, by weather, and particularly by temperature. And because of this, many of our butterfly and moth species reach a climatically determined edge to their European range within the UK. Now, because of that and because, um, sorry, no, forget that, I'll move on. Um, the, um, there are other aspects of their biology as well, uh, which are likely to make butterflies and moths good indicators of climate change, as well as their sensitivity because of this dependence on climate. So they have short lives, they can produce large numbers of offspring. And so when conditions are favorable, their populations can increase very rapidly. 
and they can fly, of course. So again, if conditions improve, they can disperse, they can colonize uh, new areas. And so all of these elements mean that not only are butterflies and moths likely to be sensitive to small, subtle changes in the climate, but also we're likely to be able to see their responses very quickly. And a third element, a third really important element, of course, is that we know a lot about our butterflies and moths, thanks to many years of recording, monitoring and study. And so taken together, these aspects mean that uh, UK Lepidoptera are a fantastic model group for understanding the impacts of climate change on wildlife. The recording and monitoring work carried out by you and thousands of other volunteers, past and present, provides the data, the starting point for uh, the science that I'm going to talk about this morning. And what amazing data they are. Millions upon millions of sightings, uh, collated, well, dating back centuries, collated through our Butterflies for the New Millennium project and National Moth Recording Scheme. And as if that wasn't enough, the UK also boasts the longest running standardised monitoring of insect populations anywhere in the world in the guise of the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme and the Rothamsted Insect Survey. No other countries have the depth and breadth of data on any insect group. And we draw heavily on these data and on other information gathered during field work to carry out scientific research to uh, improve our ability to conserve butterflies, moths and our environment. Uh, at the start of this year, butterfly conservation staff had led or been involved with over 160 scientific papers published in international academic journals. And that's not even including other contributions to publications like British Wildlife and Anthropos and Entomologist Record. The, as you can see, nearly a third of these scientific papers, 48 papers to be precise at the start of 2020, were on the topic of climate change and Lepidoptera more than on any other single topic. And the data, the evidence that you gather and the science that has been done with it are one of butterfly conservation's unique selling points and a big part of why we punch above our weight and are internationally respected. Our climate change research has been cited over 10,000 times in other scientific papers and important reports things like the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, State of Nature, and the Living Planet report that was mentioned earlier, as well as, of course, in our own publications. And this research has been uh, really important in demonstrating the real rapid responses of UK species, butterflies and moths to climate change demonstrating that climate change is not uh, a hypothetical risk or an academic exercise, but a real integral part of our everyday lives. So let's have a closer look at, uh, into some of the research into butterflies, moths and climate change. And all of the UK examples that I'm going to mention this morning are of work that butterfly conservation has been directly involved with. One of the most obvious effects of climate change for UK butterflies and moths over recent decades has been the northward spread of southern species. Here, for example, we have the comma, and the map here shows the distribution of the comma in the 1970s and early 1980s. If I skip forward 20 years to the end of the last century, when we produced uh, our Millennium Atlas of butterflies, 
you can see that the comma had spread northwards. It had colonized pretty much all of northern England, had started to appear, a uh, few individuals had started to appear over the border into Scotland and also on the Isle of Man and even in Northern Ireland. If I skip forward another 20 years to the present day, we can see that the species is now well established in Scotland, is seen regularly up as far north as Inverness in this kind of area, uh, and sometimes further north still. The butterfly has colonized the Isle of Man, uh, but still hasn't really taken off yet in uh, Northern Ireland, although I'm sure it will in due course. Here's another example, a moth this time, the Jersey tiger. And um, back in the 1800s, the only place in mainland Britain that uh, Jersey tiger occurred was down here in South Devon, uh, where I'm talking to you from this morning. And so the Victorian entomologists would have to come down on the train to uh, get their Jersey tiger specimens for their collections. And for about a century or so, nothing much changed uh, until suddenly in the uh, 1990s, the moth started to expand its range. And it's moved northwards up through Somerset and across into South Wales and eastwards as well across through Dorset. And over the same time period, this recent few decades, there seem to have been separate colonization events onto the Isle of Wight, into Sussex, and into the London area where the moth has increased extremely rapidly. Uh, this is a photo uh, taken this summer uh, of Liz Goodyear's moth trap in her garden in Hertfordshire, north of London, uh, featuring 91 Jersey tigers on that particular morning. And bear in mind that the first ever record of Jersey tiger in Hertfordshire occurred only just just over 10 years before this in 2009. So some of these species are undergoing very rapid increases in, in their abundance and distribution. So climate impacts are already apparent. Moths and butterflies that reach at the northern edge to their range within Britain are tending to expand northwards. And in this study led by Susie Mason, we looked at that in, in a bit more detail, both for moths as a group of moths that were uh, looked at here, and also for butterflies. So looking at Southern species, species that occur in Southern parts of the UK, but not all the way up to, uh, to the Northern coasts. And on average species were spreading northwards uh, at these various rates. But a key thing to note is that over time, the rates of spread, the average rates of spread, both, both for southern moths and for southern butterflies had increased substantially. So these northward spreads are accelerating over time. Now, because we have many more species of butterflies and moths in southern parts of the UK than in the north, and it's these species that seem to be benefiting from climate change and being able to expand their ranges northwards, this may, might seem like quite good news. And indeed, risk assessments that have been carried out about the climate, the, uh, the expected climate change impacts on uh, UK wildlife have suggested that many butterfly and moth species will actually increase their distributions by, uh, over the course of this century. In addition, we've seen new species colonizing from continental Europe in recent decades, things like the tree lichen beauty and the rosy underwing, and we've seen increasing frequency of some of our migratory species like the long-tailed blue butterfly. All of this seemingly driven by climate change. But while the uh, predictions for many species seem quite optimistic, responses vary considerably and uh, many species seem to be lagging behind. So they might be expanding their ranges, uh, but not anywhere near as much as we might expect in order to keep up with climate change. Silver studded blue is a good example of this. It remains a scarce and highly restricted species in Britain, 
despite the fact that climate uh, studies suggest that much of Britain is now climatically suitable for this butterfly. Now, the, um, one of the main reasons that we think is causing these lags, preventing moths and butterflies from expanding as rapidly as they might be able to uh, as a result of the changing climate, is the lack of suitable habitat within reach of their existing colonies. And we see this not only for habitat specialist species like the silver studded blue, but also for widespread generalist species uh, like the speckled wood here. Speckled wood has increased its range enormously in the UK uh, over the past sort of 50 years or so, but its rate of spread has been much slower in parts of the country that have less woodland habitat. And a recent study led by Phil Platts found that this habitat availability barrier, this uh, cause for uh, the lags that we see in, in climate change responses, uh, seem to be a major factor across many invertebrate groups in Britain. Some species like the brown argus, however, have kind of leapt over this, uh, this habitat availability barrier. As the climate has warmed, brown argus has been able to make use of uh, different caterpillar food plants, plants that occur much more widely in the landscape, in the farmed landscape, and the species has been able to spread greatly away from its uh, traditional habitats and haunts. Now, obviously, that's really good news for the brown argus, but um, really, I think the take home message for us is just how unpredictable these species responses to climate change can be. Another limitation, another reason why butterflies and moths might not be able to, to expand their ranges uh, to, uh, to meet these opportunities afforded by climate change is to do with how their populations are actually faring in general. And it does seem that having a stable or increasing population trend may be a prerequisite for being able to expand your distribution. So in the case of the gatekeeper, this species was spreading northwards quite rapidly in Britain during the 1980s and 1990s, but that uh, range expansion has slowed considerably and ground to a halt in many areas um, in more recent decades. And when we look at the uh, data from the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, the Transect data, we see that the abundance of gatekeeper has declined significantly. So there's quite a lot of evidence of apparently positive responses to climate change, uh, but there are also increase, there's also increasing evidence of ne negative impacts as well. And species of moths and butterflies that are adapted to cooler, damper climates uh, appear to be retreating. Um, and here are just three examples from our recent moth atlas of species that uh, seem to be undergoing losses shown by the yellow and blue dots, uh, pat particularly at the warmer edges of their ranges in Britain. So these species seem to be retreating northwards, westwards and to higher altitudes in the face of climate change. Some studies have uh, started to try and tease out the um, climate change element of species responses. In this study, for example, the, uh, the models, the scientists' models, suggested that climate change might be responsible for almost half of the decline, the overall decline that we've seen in widespread moth species in Britain. Uh, another study looked at uh, extreme, uh, extreme population changes for over 200 Lepidoptera species since the 1960s and found that these correlated with climatically extreme years. And the impact of extreme climatic events, extreme weather events like heat waves and droughts and floods has uh, and been neglected really until quite recently. It's a sort of new thing uh, in a lot of this research. But these kind of uh, short-lived 
but extreme events may actually prove to be really important in determining the long-term impacts of climate change on our moths and butterflies. So for example, in this study, um, the UK butterfly monitoring scheme data were used to assess the impacts of a severe drought in 1995 on butterfly populations. And we saw that in the following year, um, some of these species, these drought sensitive butterflies underwent major decreases in their numbers and their abundance. Now, historically, droughts as intense as the one in 1995 only happened about once in every 200 years in Britain. But the, uh, the projections, the forecasts of climate models suggest that these droughts will become much more frequent over the course of this century and may by the end of the century be occurring as often as once in every six years. And at that kind of frequency, populations of these butterflies are simply not going to be able to recover in between droughts. And we might expect to see major long-term declines in the total uh, uh, populations of these species. In another recent study, uh, also looking at climatic, uh, at extreme weather events, but this time looking at extremely warm weather during winter, found that over half of our butterfly species in the UK uh, suffered reductions in numbers, in abundance in the year following these extreme uh, winter warm events. And this was spread across species that spend the winter in all different parts of the life cycle, all different stages of the life cycle. So species that spend the winter hibernating as adults like the peacock here, but also those that spend the winter uh, as eggs, like the purple hair streak, uh, as caterpillars, such as the white admiral, or in the pupil stage, such as the orange tip. All these species declined in abundance following these extremely warm winters. And indeed, only two species, the holly blue and the wall, showed significant positive increases, uh, positive responses, increases in abundance following these warm weather events in winter. Another very uh, obvious effect of the change in climate that I must mention briefly is changes in the timing of biological events during the year, what we call phenology. The earlier emergence of many insect species over time in response to warming temperatures has been demonstrated around the world, including with UK moths and butterflies. So here are two examples from our recent moth atlas. There are lots of other examples in the book as well. Um, and here we see that the, uh, the black bars represent the modern day flight period of the species. And these sort of purpley gray bars show the flight period of the moth back in the 1970s. And in both these examples, you can see that the species is emerging earlier in the year nowadays and also peaking earlier as well. Now, until very recently, we didn't really know what this meant, whether this really meant anything, had any significant impacts on the changing fortunes of, uh, of our butterflies and moths. But thanks to a recent paper led by Callum McGregor, we've now started to find some links between these cha changes in timing, these phenological changes and species abundance. But the situation is quite complicated. What was found for um, butterflies and moths was that species that have more than one generation each year in those species, the earlier emergence of the first generation led to increased numbers in subsequent generations and correlated with overall increased abundance, sort of long-term abundance trends. But this was not the case for univoltine species, species that only have a single generation each year. Those were also emerging earlier, but that earlier emergence either seem to have no impact on the abundance of the species at all, or for habitat specialist species, 
it actually was correlated with declines in abundance. So it seems that for univoltine habitat specialists, coming out earlier in the year is actually a bad thing, actually leads to decreased population levels. So uh, a quick summary then uh, from the UK perspective of uh, some of the key findings from uh, this climate change research that butterfly conservation has been involved with and that has used your records, your transect counts and so on. Well, there are clearly both positive and negative impacts on UK butterflies and moths. New species have colonised and many existing species have spread northwards. But others are retreating and there's growing concern that extreme climatic events, extreme weather events uh, may have overwhelmingly negative impacts. There is much that we don't yet know and many of the responses are unpredictable. And as a result of that, I think the evidence urges us to be very cautious to try and do everything we can to limit climate change to offer our butterflies and moths the best uh, possible future. Now, I just wanted to spend a final few minutes uh, looking much more widely at how climate change might be impacting butterflies, moths and other insects worldwide. And here overall, the scientific view seems to be much less optimistic. A major recent study published by Rachel Warren and colleagues at the University of East Anglia predicted how huge numbers of species, all sorts of different species, were going to respond to climate change at a global level. And this chart is, is only part of that study. This is just the insects, but nevertheless uh, includes more than 30,000 insect species. And what the scientists did in this study was that they, they predicted the proportion of species that were going to be severely negatively impacted by climate change at these different levels of uh, temperature rise over pre-industrial levels. And by, by severely impacted, what they're talking about are species that are predicted to lose at least half of their current range. So the vertical axis here runs from no species down at the bottom to 100% of species that are going to be negatively, severely negatively impacted by climate change. And I draw your attention, I ask you to focus on the blue bars uh, across here. Uh, these are the ones where the modelling assumed that insects are going to be able to respond. They might be able to move or, or adapt or shift their habitat preferences to, uh, to try and cope as much as they can with climate change. So the blue bars are sort of, are, are a more optimistic view. Um, but even so, at 3.2 degrees rise, which is where we're heading with um, the uh, commitments that have been made by uh, governments globally at the moment, um, we find that almost half of the insect species are likely to be severely impacted at a global scale. And concerns are particularly great in the tropics, where of course most of our Lepidoptera and indeed most insect biodiversity occurs. Species here in tropical ecosystems tend to be specialists. They tend to be habitat specialists, but also climatic specialists. They tend to be able to tolerate far less or far smaller ranges of, uh, of temperature, for example, than the butterflies and moths that we know and love in the UK. That's not surprising, of course, because they, those species have evolved in what's a very climatically stable environment. But because they're habitat specialists and climatic specialists, it means they're much less likely to be able to respond positively to the changing climate. And on top of that, although most of the expected warming uh, is predicted to happen at high latitudes near the poles rather than in the tropics. The, um, the impacts in the tropics were never, could nevertheless be extremely severe. 
So subtle changes in rainfall patterns, in cloud patterns, uh, caused by changes in um, ocean currents and air circulation driven by climate change could have massive impacts. So a tropical forest like this, which is almost permanently shrouded in cloud, uh, if that cloud were uh, dispersed in a permanent, you know, in a sort of long-term way by climate change, that would have a devastating impact on that tropical ecosystem. So finally, what should we do about it? And I've got three just very sort of simple uh, suggestions for you to, uh, to take away this morning. First, find out more, find out as much as you can, not only about climate change itself, how it works, what, why it's happening, but also about the different future options open to us as humans, as, as human society. Use butterflies and moths as a way to engage people with climate change. People see butterflies and moths, they're interested in them. We know that butterflies and moths in the UK are, are responding to climate change, so they provide a natural way of engaging people with discussions around climate change. And finally, take some positive steps yourself. Whatever they might be, however small or insignificant they might seem to you in a, in a global context, but do something positive. With your help, butterfly conservation has played an important role in highlighting the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. And going forward, butterfly conservation is determined to be part of the solution to the climate crisis. Finally, I just need to thank all of you who take part in our recording and monitoring butterflies and moths, all of our scientific collaborators in the UK and around the world, uh, these people whose wonderful photographs I've used uh, in my talk this morning, and uh, to you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Richard, for a fascinating talk. I'm actually a transect um, uh, uh, in volunteer, and it's, it's wonderful to see the connection between the, the work that I'm doing. Work that I'm doing and, and, and the work that butterfly conservation does to bring it all together. Um, now, we have been looking at the questions on the uh, chat line, and I believe that uh, Richard is going to spend just a little time uh, s selecting a few because we can't answer all of them. Is that the case, Richard? Uh, have, have, you, some... have you got some, Sarah? Obviously, I've not had a chance. No, to no, you haven't. But, talking, no, no, so. of course not, Richard. <laughs> but um, has has um, has have, how are you getting on, Sarah? Yes, I have a question. Um, okay, so question you go ahead. From John and Tracy Hampshire. Um, to what extent would you say that the climate crisis is beneficial to the UK butterfly and moth diversity and numbers? Yeah, well, I, as I I tried to show, I think, in, in my talk, um, that certainly the climate change that we've experienced so far in the UK, uh, and from the evidence that we have, bearing in mind that we don't know everything, that there's lots that we still need to understand, uh, there clearly are some very positive impacts. Um, there are new species arriving, uh, we've not really seen that with butterflies yet, but there are lots of new moth species that are arriving and species of other wildlife as well, dragonflies and, and all sorts of other things. Um, so, you know, generally that's quite a positive impact on our, on our biodiversity. And of course, we're seeing um, species that were restricted to uh, fairly limited parts of the UK, being able to spread their wings as it were um, to colonize new areas. So I think if you're a butterfly enthusiast in, uh, in Northern England, for example, over the past uh, 20 years or so, you've probably seen you know, all sorts of new species spreading northwards, turning up in your gardens and your local landscapes, which obviously is, uh, and moths as well, which is obviously very nice. Um, there are negatives, of course, and particularly for those species that occur at, uh, at higher elevations and, and the sort of more northern species, higher latitudes. Um, 
but I think really the, the the negatives are still to come. You know, partly as we discover more and the impact of uh, extreme climatic events, which are obviously very traumatic for people. We think of some of the flooding events that we've had in, in uh, the UK over recent years. Um, but also it's likely that, that um, these extreme events will be quite damaging for our butterflies and moths as well. And obviously, as we look into the more distant future, we may find that actually even, even Britain and, uh, and Ireland, the, these sort of cool, damp islands on the edge of Europe, start to become climatically challenging for some of our species, um, even in the, you know, in the south, species in the south. So, um, so yeah, I hope that kind of sums it up. It's, uh, you know, it, it does appear to be pretty positive so far, but I think we need to uh, keep sight of the potential problems uh, currently and going forward uh, for our species, but also the huge damage that climate change is going to do, is already doing globally to our wildlife and indeed to, to us as humans. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, Sarah, is there, um, have you Selected yes. another one. Yes. Uh, next question is from Jim Asher, um, and he's asking: Is it known better how big a barrier the English Channel is to northward spread of continental species heading north? That's a good question, Jim. Um, I don't know really. Uh, I don't think. Well, I think if you take a long historical view of that, then we do know better because uh, it's only sort of a hundred years or so ago that. Uh, no self-respecting scientist would stand up in public and say that uh, a butterfly or a moth was capable of crossing the channel uh, for fear of ridicule, uh, because no one believed that these uh, apparently fragile little insects could do things like that. Of course, now we know that, that many species uh, crossed not only the channel, but larger bodies of water uh, on a regular basis, some as a core part of their uh, evolved life histories, things like the painted lady that Dan was talking about earlier, or the silver wine moth. Um, uh, many others make the crossing uh, more haphazardly. Lots of the uh, moths that turn up at this time of year in the autumn get people very excited. Um, are, uh, they're not real migrants, but they're clearly capable of crossing uh, bodies of water to, uh, to reach our islands. So I think the um, the channel itself clearly doesn't provide a significant barrier for many species. Well, it may do for some species, um, but it clearly doesn't per se for butterflies and moths. So I think it's more uh, in terms of colonization, it's more about, you know, how many species are arriving. Clearly, the insects arriving need to be females uh, and uh, ideally fertilized females uh, in order to actually produce young here and start the colonization process. Um, and it will depend species by species. You know, as we know, some species are very sedentary. Um, they live in colonies and, and rarely stray uh, from the, uh, the bounds of the colony in which they're born, whereas other species are much more mobile. So I haven't got any definite answer, I'm afraid, Jim, but I think, uh, I don't think the, the channel presents a, a very serious border for uh, for species moving around. Great, thank you. I think we thank have you, time Richard. for one more question. Yes. Um, and we have one from Steve Goddard, who asks, uh, Richard Summary referred to more species expected in the UK due to climate change. Can he give examples of butterflies and moths which might be likely to start being found? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, quite often get asked that and being, being um, asked to kind of you know, make a bet, as it were, on the, the next species that's going to uh, going to colonise here is a is a fool's errand, really. Um, I think, from a butterfly perspective, um, the one that uh, well, it's kind of slightly complicated, really. But I think one of the front runners has got to be the swallowtail, uh, and of course, swallowtail already occurs here in the form in the uh, specific subspecies, uh, the British subspecies of swallowtail, which is restricted to wetlands in the Norfolk Broads. But uh, in, on, in continental Europe, the same species of swallowtail occurs very widely, uh, is a species of ruderal habitats, gardens and waste, waste grounds. Um, and uh, that species has been turning up. It's 
bread uh, in southern parts of the UK uh, in the summertime. There's, um, there's good examples of overwintering um, for swallowtails in, uh, in southern England as well. Uh, I wouldn't say that we're yet at a point that it's, it's actually colonised, but I think that's a good candidate. Um, other possibilities, things like um, Queen of Spain fritillary, uh, which is in the, um, you know, there are big populations of that, of that in the dune systems over across the North Sea in the Netherlands. It's a mobile butterfly, no particular reason why it wouldn't be able to live here in terms of habitats. Um, and there are other possibilities as well. Within the moth world, there are loads of possibilities. Uh, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, there are lots of moths colonizing. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, um, species, even species that were you know, considered to be conservation, uh, threatened species or, or extinct species like the Clifton nonpareil uh, recolonized Britain in the last few years or the last decade or so anyway. So um, yeah, there's lots, to, there's lots to look out for. Thank you, Richard. I think that's probably uh, as much as we have time for today, because we want to keep to time. So I just want to say thank you again to Richard for a fascinating talk about one of the defining issues of our time. And lots of lots of juicy, juicy bits in there that I shall remember. Um, now we're going to run our feedback poll, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, a box will appear on your screen asking a series of three simple questions and you just need to click yes or no, depending on your answer. Um, we're going to allow about a minute um, for everyone to do this. So bear with us while um, it's rather, while we're silent and we're counting up. I think we've now got uh, got all the polls in. So it's it's for me now to make some closing remarks. Um, first thing I want to do is to thank our technical team. We've got through this without any disasters, which I'm very pleased about. Um, and because this is obviously our first online AGM. And so thank you to Sarah Adlam and to James Staples. I can't, can't thank you enough. I also want to thank uh, Richard again for a great talk to, and my fellow panelists, Nigel, Russell, Dan and Kate. And I just want to say also that we've had over 400 people attending this morning. And um, it may be that uh, online AGMs are the way of the future, uh, as long as we can tackle the technology, but we've done it well this time. So I want to thank all of you who have uh, registered and joined today. And um, I hope I meet some of you in person in the coming year. And meanwhile, keep safe, keep well. Bye-bye.